That's right. Thank you, Stefan. And good morning, everybody. Um, I will talk about privacy and law. However, much more from the informatics point of view. And that's what I would like to, to tell you. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work. It's about technology today. Rechts und links, ja? Okay. Sure. Yeah, it does work. So, just as a motivation for uh, what we do with data, places, uh, uh, data traces, because data traces will be the topic today, uh, is uh, about predictions of future behavior. And this is just one example. Um, well, I don't know if you if you get it, um, a sick old man and um, yeah, the service coming to tell, oh, we, we got information from the big data that we will be needed very shortly here. And um, it, it might be a correct prediction, but I'm not sure if this is the kind of service we would like to have in future. So of course, this is, uh, just a mo this is another motivation. Uh, this is a bit strange. Um, it is a very famous painting by Claude Monet, um, and um, I think it, it, wa it was sold recently for many, many, many millions of dollars or euro. Um, and uh, the, the title is uh, Petit Déjeuner. Um, and we don't know today that when it was exhibited uh, in the mid of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 19th century, it was a big scandal. Why was it a scandal? because the format of this painting was formal. It was a huge painting. It is a huge painting. And huge paintings that at that time were reserved for only formal, uh, for formal um, reasons. Um, for example, for emperors to be painted um, representation. But what Monet did is he showed exactly his family. It was very intimate. It was very private. And the public at that time had the feeling this is a no-go to show anything which is private that much in the public. So to speak, Facebook. So we have the feeling there is too much private things out there in the public which does not belong to the public. And we have the feeling, especially the young people, they are not able to keep things private. Monet is not able to keep his things private. Um, now we take this as a matter of course. We'll see how it works, uh, work out with, with, with Facebook. Okay, computer science's understanding of privacy is what I would like to tell you uh, about. You have already heard the point of view of, uh, from the legal experts, and this is also what we have learned in the informatics. Our, our way into privacy technology is through learning from the legal experts. I'll show that to you. Then something about data sources and traces which is a huge topic. I cannot go very deeply into that. It would be a series of lectures on its own. And uh, then I would like to make clear how much risk we have in dealing with privacy technology, even if we use the best technology whatsoever. And then uh, with the privacy enhancing technology, PET stands for privacy. Let me see. Oh, there's French script as well. Okay. So this PET stands for privacy, privacy or privacy enhancing technology. Um, and although we have the feeling, the hope, that with technology we can solve all the privacy problems, there are some limits which I would like to show to you. Okay, let's start with the understanding of informatics, what privacy really is. And this is not easy to understand because privacy has different meanings changing over time over history and changing over cultural contexts. We have uh, the family and the friends area, which we would agree, yes, this is a kind of a privacy area, which we would also agree today is a privacy area. But we have also, on the right-hand side, the business area, township purchases, something of, 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 this, of these applications, which we would rather regard as public, but it also has a private aspect. As 
opposed to the public government area. So all what is state, area, state affairs and, and, and government area is the real public and the business in this context has a private uh, point of view. And this is also reflected by legal aspects. Legal aspects concerning business are always private legal aspects uh, in contrast to public legal aspects which goes with state affairs. So there are different relationships between the public government uh, area and the family friends, something like classical data protection against the government, which is very strong, much stronger in the United States than in Europe. Um, um, the, the, the public has, has to keep out itself from, from these uh, family as, uh, af um, affairs. But there's also a relationship between family and the business, which goes with, with, the, with the employees or employment uh, relationships. This is also fixed by legal rules. Customers, of course, and employees have special rights against, uh, against uh, business interests, which we also understand as, uh, as uh, privacy protection. And, uh, of course, between business and public government, there are also regulations which protect private aspects of business Against, uh, against public interest. For, for example, business secrets. The public has no right to look into the business secrets. And the technology which protects these relationships are very much the same. Although there are different application contexts, the technology is pretty similar. Privacy as a legal concept, you have heard in the talk before, so I need not say much about that. Um, it all started with the right to be left alone. I'm sure that this has been di discussed in the, in the talk before. So I leave this, this legal approach away. You know that, that this is um, the first step into privacy understanding. And although there are other aspects as well which are not only legal but al also social, our learning, our means, we informatic people, learned about privacy mostly from the legal point of view. And the principles which I state here are directly <coughs> derived from legal principles and have the big advantage. They can be supported by automatic measures. They can be implemented with the help of informatics technology. This is one of the reasons why we informatic people love these principles. And whenever you go into privacy lectures, you will always learn about these principles. And I think this is one of the reasons we can support something which we call purpose binding of personal data. Personal data, they must be clearly restricted by their purpose in advance. Um, if somebody wants to work with personal data, wants to collect them and, um, uh, and work with them, then, then, then must state and um, prescribe in advance the purpose and then uh, it is not legal to use these data for any other purpose. And um, very close to this principle is the data minimization. Whatever kind of application you have, you must not use more personal data than is absolutely necessary in order to provide this service. Um, the second principle, consent and legal permission, means you can only work with personal data uh, when the one about um, the person about whom the personal data um, are related to um, have an explicit consent and say, yes, you are allowed to use my personal data. There's only one other way to use personal data, that is if there is a legal permission. It might, there might be a law. If, a, if there is a public law which allows to use certain kind of personal data for a certain prescribed, pre prescribed purpose, then it, they can be used without the consent of, uh, of, the, of the user. Otherwise, users must, must uh, have an, an explicit consent, must express an explicit consent. Number three is transparency and notice. That means whatever is done with personal data, it must be made clear in advance. These are the, the data 
declarations. You can read, ah, okay, the service will use my data for this and that explicit purpose. This must be made explicit by data declarations, such that the users can take notice of it. That's a basic idea. Users shall be able to take notice of what will happen with their personal data. Notice and then, as a second point, notice and choice by expressing the consent, yes, or saying, no, I do not want to take this service because I do not want to give you my personal data. Notice, transparency, and choice by consent or dissent. Persons con personal control means <coughs> users, number four, or number five, external uh, institutions are able to take control about the usage of personal data. Um, by notice, well, to learn what is going to happen with my data, the choice, and then, if necessary, to correct data uh, or to make sure that they are deleted if they are not used anymore. And there must be mechanisms to perform this kind of control. Um, and this, of course, goes with uh, communication. And whenever we have uh, communication, we can use our informatic technology. External uh, control means that other institutions help to control data of customers, of employees, or of citizens without the need of these persons to, to take control over the data themselves. Principle number six is confidentiality. That means whenever personal data are exchanged between parties by consent or by legal admission then, these data must be kept confidential in this relationship. Um, for example, the one who uh, receives personal data might have uh, an, an interest to make an onward transfer to others. And this must be strictly controlled. An onward transfer to other parties will only be allowed if it is consented by the confidentiality, confidentiality rules between the uh, involved parties. Yeah, these are six principles, and you will find them in every uh, uh, basics um, box, uh, an article about um, privacy. And the reason is, as I said, um, first, they express legal concerns, and second, they can be supported by automatic measures with information technology. We separate these technological supports or organizational supports of privacy um, in these two important areas. One is self-protection, the other one is system protection. Self-protection means the users can protect themselves with the help of mechanisms which they hold in their own hands. Like, it starts with, they are aware, they are educated, they know, they look on the on what happens with the data, and they can take a choice by saying, yes, I go into this service with the personal data, or no, I keep abstinent, I will not use this service. This kind of um, abstinence is um, very often today recommended to, um, to the public. Don't send your personal data so much, or for example, don't go so much into Facebook and be careful what you write on your websites, be careful what you write in, in blogs, and so forth. Be aware, don't use it as much. That's, this is one of the approaches to uh, a better um, data protection, which, by the way, I find is, a, is not a very good way to work with personal data, as we can see with Monet. Things change. Yeah, choice, I said it already. And then some tools like NoScript tool, Ghostry tool, AdBlocker, I'll come back to these tools later. These are downloaded by users, and they say, yes, I want to use these. I, I, I understand how these tools work, and I'll implement them and uh, recommend, um, and they are recommended to, to be used uh, in a, in a self-protection um, means by, by the users themselves. And one of the mechanisms which are very much recommended is end-to-end, -end. that means E2E, E2E, end-to-end encryption between two partners who exchange e email, between a user 
who uses a service, so it is between service and user. If this communication is encrypted, well, then confidentiality is enforced, and this is one of the, uh, one of the um, data protection or privacy principles. I will show you that all these mechanisms have their limits. System protection, in contrast, means things are done without explicit work of the users. They happen by themselves. For example, data minimization is a principle which must be implemented by those who implement this, the, the system and will be enforced by those who provide the service. They would, when they, if they follow the data, data minimization principle, they would not collect those data which are not needed outside of the service. And users need not do anything. They just enjoy this data minimization and um, they would not even take any awareness of it because it happens by itself. The same is with the deletion of purposeless data. Once data had been collected, had been used in the service, but are not used anymore, normally they are still kept and used for other purposes, they should, they must be deleted by legal rules. And if they are deleted, well, they are deleted by the service providers. Users need not do anything. And um, if you try to, uh, to delete your personal data with any service, you will, you will see how complicated that is. It's not easy to write to a service and say, please delete these data um, which are not needed in our service anymore. If this is done automatically, th this would be system, self, uh, system pr data protection. Or anonymization, um, which is not really... There, there are some um, mechanisms where users can use another identity, like a, like a persona or a, a pseudonym. This would be a self-protection. But uh, if there is an anonymization network, which by itself makes sure that data from A to B cannot be traced anymore, this also would be system protection without activity of uh, single users. The same is providing information for transparency um, must be done by the service providers by themselves. And then some mechanisms like the IP protocol, IP, Internet Protocol, with the addendum of security mechanisms, this works on the level of routers done by the, by the uh, router providers themselves, by the internet providers themselves, you wouldn't see that. There are uh, uh, encryption mechanisms on, 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 on the data package uh, level and the same with the SSL secure socket layer which is, uh, which is implemented and realized by the service providers with their keys and is understood by all browsers which are out there in the world. If you use a browser, they are all able to understand the SSL encryption by the service providers. This also works by itself, and users need not take any decision, except some knowledge. For example, with these SSL, you probably have already experienced that sometimes you get information, there is a certificate which is out of date, um, you cannot trust the service anymore. This is a service of the SSL, and then, then users must take some decisions. What do you do? Yes, go on, go on, go on. You should be careful with, with this kind of information. Privacy enhancing, enhancing technology, or shortly PET, which means something nice, something small, something cute, pet animals, petting, something which, which is friendly, in contrast to PIT. PIT is, um, is a bad thing. <laughs> Is a, is a pity. <laughs> you can fall into a pit, which means privacy invading technologies. This, these are the bad guys. The good guys is privacy en enhancing technology. Uh, it has been invented already, you see, some uh, 20 years ago by the Electronic Privacy Information Center, Mark Rotenberg, who is still active today in the, in the privacy area. All information technology that supports system and self data protection and that fights privacy invading technology would be called PET. And this is a typology of pets, and I will go shortly through it. 
Um, first type of pet privacy enhancing technology is communication which helps to enforce transparency, user control and so forth. Second, all tools which, ha which help to encrypt communication or data to be stored. Third, tools for anonymity or for persona communication. We can uh, use other IDs. Anonymity, I will give you an example as well. All types of filter tools which keep out data which you do not want to be collected without, uh, without seeing it. Um, and then a very delicate area is the policy tools. Policy tools means privacy policy is a kind of an agreement between service providers and service users what kind of personal data are used and how they are used. This is a policy. Well, these policies are somehow expressed. And now, of course, in the following communication, this policy should be, should be accepted. Um, how do you control that? This is where policy tools might help. But I can tell you we have no final solution until today. There have been some very nice approaches, but they have failed so far. Number six, which is a little bit more new, and I'll give you an extra talk about that this afternoon, is on rights management, which helps you, which helps the users to manage their rights also with respect of privacy data. So this, this afternoon I'll tell you something about the rights permission a permission rights model in the, in the mobile area. Yeah, type one, I can go through it now very fast because I've told you already, with re always with a relationship to the principles. Communication refers to the principle transparency, choice and consent, user control, of course service to users and users to service. For, for example, service to use all accounting info and more or the users to service all the payment uh, things are or can be part or are at least subject to privacy enhancing technology because payment, for example, can be done with a lot of extra personal data or with very little of it. Um, and I think something like choice consent and user control, it is obvious why this is part of communication. This is done by communication. And indeed, this type of um, of privacy enhancing techno technology is much better with electronics than it used to be in the, in the paper area. So uh, to ask a firm, please tell me what kind of personal data have you stored about me? If you do that by paper, then you must write it down in the paper, you put it in an envelope, stamp on it, and send it two days to go, two days for work in the office, two days to be sent back, it um, takes a week or two weeks until you get an answer. This works much faster with uh, email or even with a direct um, a syn synchronous um, a communication. And you will find that very often that uh, you have uh, the, the possibility to press a button to get direct information about um, information about the, the, the privacy data policy and so forth. So here technology electronic and internet can help a lot and even more than uh, used to be in old times when we did not have this kind of communication technology. Yeah, encryption. This is the area uh, or the, the, the type of privacy enhancing technology which is, um, is recommended so much as the, uh, the king's road to privacy. So you should all use encryption and whenever you can come into a, a delicate area of communication, make sure that everything is encrypted. Um, if you use Facebook, make sure that Facebook communication is encrypted. If Facebook does not um, does it do encryption, then don't use it. And please don't use WhatsApp. Use Telegram instead because Telegram is encrypted and WhatsApp is not. Yes, WhatsApp is encrypted as well now. So it's much better. So encryption is um, is the type of privacy enhancing technology which is very much in uh, public awareness. Something like digital signatures, encryption itself, even hidden encryption, yeah? Is there a uh, low that prevents companies like WhatsApp from encrypting the code or something? Or is it, okay, or is it 
Okay, you already um, uh, you you hit the nail. <laughs> this is exactly the problem. Uh, encryption, as such, doesn't say much. Who owns the keys? Is one point. Next point is those who get the encrypted data and are um, and are allowed to decrypt it. And what do they do with the data after after they get it in clear? And uh, these rules are not covered by encryption itself. Encryption is really just hiding on the communication way or in the storage. And all the um, consequences um, are, are, are not addressed by just encryption. So you're right. Um, this must be made clear before you can trust the service. And with Facebook, we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. This <laughs> this differs from country to country. Um, there are countries that allow encryption, and others do not. That's a long story. The discussion started in the nineties. And it's not finished, and I thought it was finished at the end of the 90s or middle of the 90s. There was a, a huge approach all over the world uh, to disallow encryption. And it started with, we don't look at, on China or Russia, it really started with the United States. It said, no, it is too dangerous, it uh, supports terrorism if the terrorists use uh, encryption and we, the good guys uh, of law enforcement, are not able to, to uh, read in this terrorist communication. So every good citizen must not be afraid of the public um, law enforcement to read their communication because they are good. We, don't, we will not follow them. So please give us all your keys. And they made a law, the, uh, the, the, the um, data escrow. So we had to, they had to give the, the keys to, to, to public institutions. And the same happened in France. Uh, and this was discussed in Germany as well. Uh, and the discussion took maybe two or three years. And the reason that we didn't do it in Germany was not because we uh, trust our citizens so much, <laughs> but in fact that the economy made sure um, that uh, a kind of um, disallowing encryption doesn't really help. There are too many ways to undergo um, these rules, for example, by steganography. Uh, you, can hide you can hide communication, and if you're not allowed to use encryption, then you can hide the encryption as well, um, and um, it doesn't work. So if you, if you make, what was the, uh, how did they say, if you make cryptography illegal, then only illegals will be able to use uh, cryptography. So that, 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 that was one, one of the points. So um, it was not realized in Germany, and we had free encryption here. That helped our um, security technology a lot, because we could produce encryption software and sell it to, co to countries where the United States firms were not allowed to do. So we could, we, could, we could sell our products. But strange enough, this discussion comes, out, comes up these days again, <laughs> even in Germany. So we'll see uh, what the, uh, the result will be. Um, but even so, we'll see, um, you, you really hit the nail, uh, it is, uh, encryption itself does not help much. It looks nice if things are blurred and you cannot read them directly, but if you have the key or if you have uh, access to the key, then, then you can always decrypt uh, data. So if I have time, I'm not sure, but if I'm timing the end, I can give you also uh, an, an overview on the limits of cryptography, which, yeah. Not to protect the data?
In, in the endpoints. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, it is important to make this difference between the endpoints and the wire, or the place of storage. But nonetheless, even on the wire, it is not protected if you don't have full control of the keys. So in the escrow, in the escrow situation, if you give your key to others and they get uh, technical access to the wire, it is encrypted on the wire, but they can read it. Yeah. That, that is this point. On the other hand, you are right. If the keys are well protected well, and the wire is protected and does its service, then still on the endpoints there is a risk. Yeah. How do my how does my partner deal with my personal data? Yes, that's right. Onward transfer is uh, one of the examples. If they if if you use strong cryptography, and if they don't get the keys, there are a lot of ifs. <laughs> And, and uh, one of the problems is, that was the question with, with, with Facebook. Uh, Facebook, they swear that they don't give the keys to, to, to NSA. And there are some good reasons why they shouldn't. But we have no proof. <laughs> Yeah, they, 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 they also have been approaches to make cryptography weak in order to allow those who know the, the, the black holes to... to get, uh, exactly. Yeah, these are the limits of crypto. And there are much more. There are much more. And even if you encrypt anything on the wire, what does that mean on the wire? It means in the communication application, for example, email, end-to-end, -end, what is encrypted? It's just the content, not the addresses. So still, you will still know who communicates with whom about what subject field. So all the header fields remain, remain open, unless you use SSL and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's OK. So let's, let's lo look at the next. Oh, we are with anonymization. Yeah, this is a type of, uh, this, is, this is a um, privacy-enhancing technology type, which I, I will show to you later in, in more detail, uh, how by system mechanisms there can be uh, a data protection and anonymization without uh, the users to do much about it. It's done by the service itself. Um, for example, by mixes and by remailers. May I, may I ask who in this room knows what um, a mix is in the, in, the, uh, in the context of anonymization or a remailer? Okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll show that to you. So next type would be the filter tools. I think this is a matter of course you understand uh, spontaneously what that means. Filters which uh, keep, for example, from web communication, keep out uh, um, traces, uh, cookies, um, with the web, uh, web washer or the, the, the cookie cooker, uh, or, you can, or it helps you to put the browser settings in a way that there is data minimization enforced on, on, on your browser communication. For example, histories and these things. Um, very interesting field is the referrer data field. The referrer data field with, uh, with web communication tells the service from which website you came before. Uh, and uh, this, is a, this is a header field, and this, of course, can be filtered out by communication. Um, it has a certain disadvantage because then you cut off the sessions and maybe that the service will not be able to follow what you have done before and give you the right service. So this is a delicate thing. You must know what you do. PICS, content label, content filter, was one of the approaches for policies which have not 
uh, which ha had no access, uh, no success after all. The idea was there's a, a lot of illegal or dirty content in the network, network which you do not want to have either yourself or your children. And so you implement uh, a, a label watcher, a content label watcher, PIX was one of the standards. I forgot what it really stands for, but of course the, the association is, is with pigs, with the swines, uh, the, the bad things uh, should be kept out. Um, there is a predefined con uh, uh, content and the service providers who accept the standard would put the label, be careful, this is uh, pornography, and then with your pornography filter you can keep this information away from your children. That was a standard, very nice idea, um, theoretically sober and clean, but for practice it, it never worked out. Um, then of course firewalls for PCs and malware scanner are much in use and they do their job of course. Spybot, I think some of you use this kind, this is, this is a way how you can scan uh, fast through your, uh, through your system and get information, there's, ad, uh, there's an ad tracker, there, is a, there are viruses and so forth. Um, very simple tool which you implement fast and however not easy to understand everything um, in our lectures, um, in the exercises, we do a lot of work to help the students to work with these kind of tools. Policy tools, P3P, I should mention P3P to you. Um, also a brilliant idea for a policy tool um, which is even a, a worldwide web standard, but it's not in practice. Um, the idea is P3P stands for Platform for Privacy Protection. And the platform works like this. Um, website providers would offer a declaration of data in a formalized language, in the P3P language. The browsers are able to read this language. They read the, 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 the data protection declaration, the P3P declaration, and decide on behalf of the browser, yes, I accept this kind of data, personal data collection, or I do not accept. And then the communication would be continued or not. So it's just the declaration which we have now as well, but in, in human language. And um, the uh, interpretation of the declaration on the browser side. And this should be automized. That was the idea of P3P. Automize this communication about the data, personal data declaration. Well, but it didn't work out because um, to write such a declaration in a formal language is not easy. Um, and um, the service providers, Although in some countries they had uh, the, the legal, they, they had to, had to de declare P3P by, by legal rules, but they didn't understand how to do it, so they just copied any declaration from any other service, and we, we counted uh, the different types of P3P declarations in the world, and um, so many of them were just the same, and uh, we saw that um, it was never, there was never a, a serious basis of expressing the, uh, the right data declarations with the help of P3P. So the, it is not used anymore and um, I'm not sure if with uh, new language approaches we can have a P3P plus, so it's kind of a semantic P3P. So with the help of, of web science technology we might, we might do a better job than we did before. P3P is purely on a syntactic level. Finally, rights management, digital rights management, of course, is, um, is common to you. You know that. Um, copyrights and usage rights to express them and to enforce them also had their pitfalls, didn't really work out as we had, uh, had planned in the beginning. Um, but very much uh, in discussion now are the mobile apps permission, for which I'll give you an extra lecture this afternoon. You mean the, the, the intermediaries? Well, this was also one of the ideas, let's say 2000 to 2010, to, uh, <coughs> to, uh, to have services which help service providers and service users to deal 
with, a poli with good policies and to support these policies, to enforce these policies. Uh, and one example could be a search engine which helps to bring the right parties uh, on, on, a, on a data protection, on the right uh, or same data protection level together. But I put a question mark there because the search engines on the other side, they are so powerful data collectors that their interest to collect many data is much bigger than to protect or to, to, to enforce a data minimization. They would have the power, from the te technical point of view, they would have the power to, to enforce policies because they, um, they are always uh, in, in the middle of, of most communication in the web. Uh, or with route control would be another example. A route control could be used to make sure that data which must not be in the network are cut away, are deleted. And this could be, for example, personal data that shouldn't be in the web. By the way, I remember the Ringelstein's uh, doctorarbeit, uh, his thesis worked on a route control mechanism, um, on a language with, with the help of which route controller could read, ah, these data do not belong into this subnetwork, so delete them. Yeah. So these were uh, theoretical ideas very much in the academic area, but they have not become uh, real. Do you have uh, any knowledge about what you would say are the main uh, hindrances to the implementation of these things? Earlier we were talking about the psychology and the assumptions involved, but I wonder what you what you, you, you mean what like why are these things being implemented? Just economic interest or Well economic inter economic interest is certainly always a, a reason. So if there would be strong economic interest, they, maybe that they would put more power into, um, into distributing um, tools or helping the education in the schools and so forth. So this will always be a reason. But I think also the technology is not ripe enough with respect of load on people what they must do individually compared to, um, to, the, to the utility they get out of it. So, for example, with P3P, also users, they must put a certain setting in their browsers which enables them to understand the P3P declarations of the service providers in a correct way. And if there's a disagreement, then they would be asked, they had to take a decision. That's a lot of work, a lot of education, a lot of understanding you must have and what is the result? The result is that the services don't get my birth, date of birth. <laughs> they shall have my date of birth and I <laughs> have a good time. So I think this, uh, the, t the technology, this is one of my main hypotheses, is the, the privacy technology, the state of the art is much too much load on the individuals. Much too much self-protection, not enough system protection. So this is my explanation. Um, but this, of course, also goes with, with, um, with economic interest, I'm sure. And there's a huge economic interest on, on dealing with personal data. Anyway, data sources and traces. Yeah, here we are with the economic interests. Why do they do that? What is the motivation of the data collection? First of all, law enforcement. Fighting crime. Yes, we do want to be protected against crime. Predictive policing, yeah, why not? Predictive policing means uh, law enforcement bodies get information from big data where probably in near future will be criminal activities and we can organize our forces and uh, our resources in order to fight that early. Yes, we, want to, we do want to have that. Scoring, insurances. Well, we are all young, we are all healthy, and we do want to pay less insurance fees. And yes, why not? Scoring is fair, scoring is right, we like that. But uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, is it really fair? Well, I'm not sure. Custom relation, yes, we want to be uh, treated nicely by our service providers. We like that, but <clears throat> is it necessary that they get that much information? So this is also a borderline. Human resource management becomes difficult. On the one hand, we don't like that, that our employers or future employers know so much about us. On the other hand, everybody of us does exactly the same. 
when I get information of an employer or of new assistant or of students and I don't know much about them, then I look into the internet and try to find out what I know about them and do all this what a normal human resource officer would do. So also, <laughs> bad, good, I don't know, I'm not sure. User-specific advertisement, I think everybody hates that. We don't need that, but this is the biggest money. And the political persecu persecution is worst of all. No, we don't want to have that. But actually, that's the same. What is law or against the law in one country is po political pr persecution in the other country. Or even in the same country, it can be interpreted in one or the other way. You are a criminal, one would say. The other would say, you are a political fighter, a freedom fighter. So we know that from, from Snowden, for example, who is both. <laughs> so this is really very delicate, and you see that uh, the motivation is huge. And as I said before, user-specific advertisement is the biggest machine, the biggest uh, motivation for collecting uh, data. And not only that, it happens just by itself. Um, the, the, the bitter truth is that every single person in this room also supports this way of user-specific advertisement. By what daily action? You all have uh, downloaded a lot of apps on your mobiles. How much have you paid for it? Almost nothing. A lot of money which goes there through user-specific advertisement. So that's, that's how we do that. The, yeah. I wonder if you think general ads are better or user-specific ads are better? I, here I mean the user-specific. Yeah. That's, the, my, that's, that's exactly this one. There's a, there's a type of, of data source. Uh, by my own action, I, I behave in a way this is collected, is observed, is collected, then my behavior is understood, and according to my behavior, there's a prediction about my future behavior, I get the specific advertisement, which is very often precise. We would lose our what? Uh, solidarity. Solidarity, exactly, yeah. This is the individualization would take away solidarity, yeah. yeah. What did, I put, what did I put here? It is a green? No, it's red. But there's a green bracket. <laughs> and I think you, uh, you addressed the green bracket. That's true. Of course, there are, uh, there are also opportunities with it. And after all, it is a political decision or societal decision. How do we want to deal with these data? The dangerous thing now is that these things are collected without public knowledge. Things happen in the background. For example, with the, with the, um, with the health uh, uh, watches and with the, with, the, with the tools for jogging and uh, the, the, the whole health area. And uh, these data are collected in the first place for your, for your personal benefit. And you like to take measure of, of, of your uh, advances and so forth. But these data can also be used by insurances in order to find out 
how uh, your, 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 your future chances to become sick or to, to remain healthy is. And this can be used in order to keep persons out of the insurance. And we don't know that. If we would know that, would say, yes, there's a good way to make insurances better, uh, then people are aware and know for what they collect these data. But as long as they don't know it, uh, I see the dangerous part, I see more dangerous parts in it than, than uh, healthier parts in it. But it's a political dis discussion. The problem today is too much data are collected without public awareness. That's your point? Yeah. yeah. No, well, uh, but, but I agree. This is, there, there, there are opportunities and there are dangers. And uh, there is very little knowledge about what really goes on with, uh, with the collection of, of the big data. Yes. Yes. So this is again a question that uh, uh, we should think about. So yeah. If we are ready to pay for data protection, yeah. in the first place, then you must pay. Are there users ready to pay for data yeah. protection? Yeah. 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 So that also needs to be answered. Yeah. It is, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. The problem of this discussion is, as you put it, the question is, Am I ready to pay or not? But this is not, not a fair question. The fair question is, in what way am I ready to pay? Because you do pay anyway. But this is hidden by this question. Pay yes or no? No, I don't want to pay. OK, you are free not to pay. But in reality, you do pay by the, by the, by the data. So, and uh, I'll come to that uh, back in the next slide, that the, your personal behavior provide some information, I give them away, I pay, and I have no disadvantage of it. Yeah? So why, why, shall I, why shall I pay in euro or in dollar if I can pay for something out of which I don't have any disadvantage? But this is a very dangerous question. I'll come to exactly back to this question on the next slide. Sell it to other companies. Yeah? OK. Uh, the motivation should be personal data are, uh, have value. They have value. They have financial value. You can use this. Even if you don't use them themselves, you can sell it to others. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah by exactly this reason, yeah. That's true. Yeah. And then I went, I went out of uh, WhatsApp. And, and many others also as well. And now after two or three years, all my friends are back to WhatsApp and I'm not. <laughs> so I, I'm out of this world. I use Telegram, and, which, is a, which is a Russian company. It's a Russian company. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, you know, I w I, I'm in Facebook, so the Americans know about me. I'm in Telegram, the Russians know about me. And I hope they do not talk <laughs> with one another too much. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I'm coming back to your point, what really happens with these data. I have personal action. I do something, and this is, this is collected. I agree, I provide, I act, I'm observed, I know that because I've agreed. Well, not always very aware, but at least I have, at some point I have said yes. So that's, we know that. But there's another type. Um, there are data collected about me without my consent. I'm not asked, but in fact, we do know that this happens like, for example, uh, for example, alumni lists, the schools collect the data of their alumni and put them somewhere on the web, or a credit reports of Shufa, this is even by law, so this is, it's fine, and this happens at, at many points. 
Or whenever there is an article in a newspaper and your name is mentioned there, then of course this is published in the web and, and never, you have never been asked. So there are a lot of data collected by third parties about you. And um, in a way, we are also aware about that. Most interesting, I find number three, because this is out of our observation. This is data sources by environments, and you are not, the personal data are not collected individually, but more in general types, like a vector space. There's a vector space with some points, and uh, even if a person is a special vector there, it's not these single vectors which are there, but just dimensions. For example, habitation, occupations. So certain occupations have a certain behavior. Professors are calm and uh, don't have uh, many legal conflicts, and uh, they would break cars, and they, they drive slowly. So, of course, they get a better insurance. Uh, professors, it's not my name. But once I ask for an insurance, they ask for my occupation, then whoop, they look into the dimension and they know a lot about me. So the same with occupation, education, what kind of education, hobbies, sports, arts, what kind of music, shopping uh, behavior, not of an individual, but of a type of individuals. For example, if you're asked at, um, um, if you pay, you cut for payment, please give me the code number of your city code number of your city has nothing to do with me. So I give him a code, code number, but the, the same happens. According to the code number of the city, you have bought a special type of good. They would derive that people of this city prefer this kind of good. And if at any other point it can't, you tell your, 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 your town and your name, then you can look into this dimension and understand your personal behavior with a mapping or a combination of the different, of the different dimensions. So th putting these information together has nothing to do with you as an individual in the first place. It's just some trans-individual cluster. But after just one match, you have never been asked before, only, only very abstract things about you. But at one point, you bring two or three information together, just one match, and then in the whole cluster, the vector is clear, and with the vector, all the information about you and uh, much deeper knowledge about you than, um, than you even know by yourself. Um, and the interesting point is, if I give information out of myself in, in this uh, respect of number three, but even with the others, you might not have a direct individual disadvantage out of it. But the measurement of the world is, uh, is um, improved. The measurement becomes more precise. And so the whole society is affected by being observed in a more precise way. And this, in the long run, has, of course, a back effect on individual, on individual life in a, in a political or societal sense. Yeah, trace by own activity. I said that already this is a matter of course. Traces by mobility. I'll come back to that in the lecture this afternoon. It's a lot. It's a lot what the mobiles know about you. And um, with many apps, you agree that they collect these information about uh, not only information, but also action. Take action, full internet access, read contact data, read telephone status, change telephone status, um, use the contact data. Write SMS, not receive SMS, but also send SMS, use the telephone, and so forth. Switch on the camera. All these things can be organized by mobile permissions, and I'll come, as I said, back this, this afternoon. Okay, so I think I have another 20 minutes or 25 minutes, um, and I would like to go through the, uh, the um, privacy area uh, with the technology which is there and what risks remain with, uh, with the privacy. Whenever you implement any technology or use technology, uh, you do that because you, you, you assess uh, the risk uh, in a way that you say, 
I want to reduce the risk and instead use this uh, technology instead, this protection mechanism instead. So it is important to understand the risk, and risk is a very important part of this model, which I don't want to go deeply into, but just uh, show you shortly the, the trust model. A trust model means it describes how trust has trust a trustee, how tr persons trust other persons, how persons trust institutions. So there's a truster, a person with a certain propensity to have this trust and would trust on the left-hand side a trustee, which may be an institution, or a trustee, somebody who is trusted. And this model just tells you a trustee, if, want, if a trustee wants to be trusted, it must be able to perform the service, it must be, have a good will to do it in a good way for the truster, and it must not be corrupted integrity. At least these three basic properties must, a trustee must have. So we have the trustee, we have the truster in a trust relationship, and this is the point which I want to uh, emphasize here. Only is you needed in situation where the, the relationship between truster and trustee is risky. If there's no risk, you don't need trust. You just do it. <laughs> no problem. But if there's a risky situation, and if you're in a risky situation and the trust himself has no control, for, for example, as a passenger in an airplane, you have no control of the cockpit, so you must trust the pilots. You have no control, and uh, flying with uh, some metal in, in the air is risky. Okay, so you trust, they are able to do that, and they have good will, and uh, they are not corrupted, so you trust. In a risky situation, and is used if the truster perceives a certain risk. So this is exactly what happens in the privacy situation. We take personal data as risky, and now we ask ourselves, do we trust the internet? Do we trust the medium? Do we trust the endpoints? That's not only on the wire, but also the endpoints. Whom do we have to trust in order to get the privacy problem under control? And that's very complicated. And to make a clear map of the risk and trust situation helps a lot to build good, to build good technology. So M3 would be the risk. M M1, the model model element one would be the truster. Model <laughs> element number two would be the trustee. Model element number three would be the risk. And it is uh, part of the requirements engineering, which is also part of the informatics. A science requirements engineering to analyze the risk. In order to analyze risk, you must specify what is the subject of trust. You must specify the specific risk, what can go wrong, and you must estimate the damage. Risk, you know, is, uh, has two dimensions. One is, uh, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the damage, and the other one is how much can it happen frequency. So, and you must estimate that in order to understand, yes, it's too big, I have to do something against it, or, or, or I have to trust somebody, or it's, the risk is not really big, so I can do it myself or take the risk on my shoulders. Next step is, if you have analyzed the risk, is there any measure which limits the risk? You must specify the measure. If you have the measure, there will be a remaining risk. It might be slower, smaller, but still there's a remaining risk. And if you have put this picture together, you still should understand, and what now is the reason of trust that I am able to go into this risky uh, uh, relationship? And this might be something like an exchange of resources. I give you something, I get, I get something on the other side. So if you uh, do something against my trust, then I get a compensation out of it, for example. There could be a common value, like a cultural value, uh, legal agreement, we all behave in a legal way. Uh, it could be a contract, which exactly describes the relationship between trust and trustee, or it could be a common interest. I trust you, because after all, we, have this, we share the same interest. You will not work against me uh, th that would be against your interest. This is often the case with, uh, with business relationship. The customer trusts the service provider 
or the, 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 the business, because if the service provider um, is, uh, is doing something against um, the contract or against, um, against the rules, then the service provider, after all, will run out of business. Because this is this, this common, common value of a, of a free market. Yeah, the risk with privacy now can be easily uh, st substructured into these principles. Risk of purpose binding, data minimization, consent, transparency, personal control, all these principles which I had mentioned before. And this helps you a lot to specify the risk and the, re and, and the related measurements much more precisely. To give just one example, the risk with confidentiality. That's the way how uh, um, a requirements engineer would, would uh, do it. For example, three risks, which I called here R1, R2, R3. One risk would be the trustee, the one whom I give um, sensitive data. The trustee transfers this to others. This is a risk. Why is it a risk? Because I cannot control what my partner is going to do with my data after all. I give him the data, then he has the data. So I must trust that he will not transfer them to others. This still is a risk. Or even if the trustee or the partner is benevolent, best uh, intention to work in a good way for you, but is maybe unable to do that, is careless, um, or applies no m protection measures himself or the wrong measures. And this happens so often that service providers have personal data of their customers and then some hackers crack them and then they are gone. So that was not risk one, that was risk two. Wrong measures or weak measures. Um, or also risk three, the protection measures that they took were vulnerable. R3 is the part where we informatics people do the most work on it, working on, uh, on the quality of the protection mechanisms. So the, to the measure against that would quality requirements for technology, updates, additional sales protection, uh, and so forth. A lot of things which you can do in, in order to minimize or to reduce the risk R3. What, did you, what, what would you do with the risk R2? Quality requirements for the trustee, education, legal requirements, customer pressure there's customer pressure and if the, the service providers are well educated then they would not be careless. They would understand what they have to do. Uh, they would not apply wrong measures because they are educated to use the right pressures. That's why we do all this uh, education in schools and universities because you all will become service providers and then you should provide the right measures, not the wrong measures because you have learned to write the, use the right ones. Yeah, and with R1 that's, uh, that's um, very delicate. We have no direct way to control our partners that they use the data they have in an appropriate way. There might be a common interest, general trust. The only strong mechanism we have is external control. Is external control um, in advance or even in a forensic way if things happened you can prove that they have used the data in an illegal way. In fact, it's a research gap. We are looking for new proof methods, something like maybe watermarking delicate data, finding out these data, the purpose of these data, where to be in another place, but not here, but I find them here and I can't prove that. These things I mentioned before was the thesis of Ringelstein and many others who do work here in order to to improve the methods for finding out the data are in the, in the right or in the wrong place. So in fact, the risk with confidentiality is there. We have some mechanisms, but it's altogether not very strong. We live with a lot of risks. Um, yeah, and still you have the remaining risk, lack of integrity of the benevolence of the trustee. How can you deal with that? Uh, technical organizational integrity of the medium. Yeah, the medium is the internet. The internet is huge. The internet is open and is, um, is a playing ground of hackers worldwide. My working hypothesis here is institutional trust in the medium 
would strengthen the trust in the trustee. It's not a matter of course. And um, it's really a hypothesis. I cannot prove it, or we haven't proved it yet. Um, how can I find out that if the medium works fine, then also the user of media of the other side would increase in uh, trustworthiness? If this is true, then the, um, those service providers who use the medium, who use the internet, have an interest in order to improve the trustworthiness of the medium. That is, have an interest to implement more system protection. This costs a lot of money. So, and they must bring up the money in order to improve the, uh, the system protection mechanisms. And um, this is also true for public services. So again, it's the question if the public, if the society should not invent, invest, I'm sorry, should not invest more money, more resources in the medium, because if the medium is trustworthy, then all its users and service providers are as well. That would be the hypothesis number one. Medium security must work automatically with no burden on users. I said that before. There's too much burden on users, uh, and um, users have no, in, no direct individual disadvantage, so they do not take too much care uh, about the medium security. But if it would work much more automatically, the situation would be much better. A very interesting question is, if we know, or if you know, a lot of uh, technical background, do you feel better or do you feel worse about the internet? If you understand what can go wrong in detail, do you become more afraid or do you become more safe? So if you tell you in every detail, how an airplane can fall down, we say, okay, now I know it, and I trust it will not work, it will not happen. Or would, you, would it increase? So how much education should we really put into, uh, into the world in order to, to, um, to increase trust? Um, I've put this question to our psychological experts, and they haven't found a clue so far to measure this and find a correct answer to this question? I would say, at a minimum, it depends on how you frame it. I mean, you keep talking about risk. Even when you say, like, uh, things like, uh, even when you were talking about risk itself, I mean, you didn't take into account at all the benefit that you're trying to get. I would say. Yeah. I mean, you didn't. No. Also, I mean, you could teach people, okay, this, these are the risks, but also these are the benefits. Yeah. I would say that so it helps. I mean, if you only talk about the things that can go wrong, then yeah. people are going to take it. Yeah. But if you talk about the things that, if you only talk about the things that yeah. can go right, then yeah. people are going to like it. So, so that yeah. So you you should put transparency on both, on uh, on uh, what can go wrong. You should know that, yeah. but um, but this is this is the situation how we estimate it is, yeah. and what we have done, and we have done the, the very best, and yeah, yeah. I made the experience when I talked even more technically about risks in, uh, in, in, in internet things, what things that can, that can go wrong. I sometimes found the reaction, before I came to your lecture, I loved my PC, but now I wouldn't open it anymore. <laughs> so don't tell me so much of these things. Yeah, okay. Well, and the same, you can go, the limits of PET, you can go through, and I will, I will not do that. You, you can get this information, you can read it on yourself. It's always the same way. Risks on purpose binding, data minimization, reasons for distrust, and measures what they would require. Or on consent, what is the reasons for distrust, and what are measures, what, 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 what kind of measures are required to, to help here. The same with transparency notice, um, uh, transparency, transparency principle, and the, the um, possibility for users to take notice. What is the risk? Well, here, for example, here it's just, for example, what it, what it means. But what are the reasons for distrust and uh, what do, do, do measures require? Uh, or with external control or with confidentiality, which I've mentioned already before. So you can go through all the, all the examples. And because you brought up the problem with the confidentiality, you can maybe try to go through this again. Reasons for distrust is that business with perfect data is profitable. It is money. 
it is valid, or I think it was your point, to say they just collect the money, uh, they, they collect the data because they have value and you can sell them. Uh, the server security is hardly detectable. That's another problem that there are no means for you to find out how the security situation really is on the other side. You have to trust it. Um, and the uh, data is a paradise for hackers, as we know. So it is really dangerous up there. Um, so let us recap personal integrity and procedural governance of the partners in the first place. Then technical organization integrity of the medium in the second place. Both we have no means to enforce them individually. And that means you need a combination of network and end-to-end -end encryption. Both must come together. So end-to-end -to -end encryption is fine, but then <coughs> we still have a lot of public header information in the network. So if they work together, then we have saved, uh, so to speak, double, double, double lock. Um, then benevolence uh, by ethics, awareness and control is part of communication. That's in fact what we're doing really here. And the uh, purpose finding levels required is a research gap. Uh, we still have to put a lot of work in order to improve this, or even to understand really how the, the right key is to help to enforce purpose finding. I think this is so deeply a separate problem of semantics that um, education like the semantics web and uh, everything related to the relationship between syntactical rules and making semantics more optimizable is, is, is one of the important ways to, to have a path to, to um, make a step forward. Okay. So I would like to finalize this part by some hypothesis. Implicitly, I said in the ring, so this is a kind of summary. Individual actions do not lead to individual disadvantages. I addressed that before, but they lead to social, well, at least to social change. If this is only damage, we can discuss that. There are also opportunities with it, but at least there must be a public awareness of what the consequences of individual actions is, not for me as a person, but for the society. Individual consent <coughs> is an overload of the users and anyway it remains toothless without external control. So it's fine, it's a legal <coughs> required, but there must be an explicit consent. But first of all, do I really understand all the uh, consequences of consent? So if you read the data declarations, they are so complicated, you do not really understand it. Nonetheless, you express your consent, and then what the other side does with it, you cannot control it anymore. So you need, in this place, more external control, which is also risky. Users must be unburdened of the protection work. And uh, data networks should be anonymous. The networks, I'm not saying communication is anonymous, but the networks, those elements of the networks which just transport the IP data, um, where there is no communication relationship um, with respect of the application. So IP could be done anonymously, which is expensive by the way, uh, and the classification, which we enjoy in uh, real communication that we know one another or knowledge of one another, have a good service for should happen only on the application level. Um, and uh, <coughs> yeah, I think uh, I think system data protection must be extended. This is a general political view. We have a lot of support now, um, also financial support, research support for research projects for, um, for um, personal data protection, for self-data protection. For example, in Germany, we just pay a hell of a lot of money for the so-called first which is a huge um, project, which is done by my own university in Darmstadt. We pay a lot of money out of it. But this is pure self, pure self-protection. Okay, fine, self-protection is fine. But there's almost no money for data protection, for, for a system data protection projects. So there's no money for, for IP anonymization 
or for external control support and so forth. So I think we need more system protection, not so much of the self protection. And I think at this point, I will end the first part. And we will see you what time? Uh, one hour lunch break, so we will we meet at 1.10. 1.10. See you later. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Part two of privacy technology, and it's a very specific topic, but I think an important one because it's so, it's so real. And it's your everyday life. Mobile apps security and privacy. Mobile distributed app security problem. There's something special with security of mobile applications. Others, or in contrast with, with, with other environments, mobile is special. I would like to explain to you the basic architecture of apps, how these apps work on the mobiles, and, and I'll take an example, namely Android. So it is not very much different from iOS, but a little bit, so it's good to have a concrete example. Uh, and then within the architecture, the permission model, and it all culminates then in the permission groups, which you know, but then probably you understand better what the meaning of these groups is. And I'd like to give you some hypothesis on my view for self-data protection for the apps. OK, mobile smartphone, smartphone security problem. Um, it starts very simple, namely mobiles are nothing else than computers, or they are also computers. So all the security problems of computers are inherited by mobiles, of course. They can attack, they can be attacked, just like any other computer in a network. And then we have all the instrumentarium of security problems, which I'm not going into uh, more uh, in this lecture, because this is a lecture on its own. So that's normal. But mobiles provide some specifics. Um, well. And you see the meaning of the mobile devices is increasing. Where will you have the mobile device? This one. But even more, Internet of Things, um, that is uh, mobiles which you do not carry with yourself like this, but which are, well, integrated with any small things like log logistic elements or with clothing or whatever. And after all, these things have much the same technology than the mobile. So these really come together and you see it. It, uh, it's of growing importance. Mobile apps are connected to the world like this. People use devices, have devices, carry devices. Apps are on the devices and, well, they are, uh, they, they, they are attacked by the connected world and they can attack the connected world, namely other mobile resources, so apps to apps, or the rest of the of the internet, other internet resources, other internet users. And the danger from the other side is also from other apps and, uh, of course, from any other service or resource which is, which is in the internet. For example, and it's only an example, apps attack mobile and internet resources, for example, like this. Normal apps written for normal usage and not dangerous, for example, an information service for train connections, and uh, how do these work? They have access to some services through an application programming interface. It is programmed into the app in a way that they can read databases. For example, of Lufthansa or from the train service, and it's the real databases which these apps read through the programmed programming interface uh, um, access. So as long as you use the apps in the programmed way, everything is fine. But if you, and this has happened uh, with, uh, especially with the, with the train information system, if they are reverse engineered, you get the resource code and now reprogram them and use the same interfaces 
in an unauthorized way, then all of a sudden with the same app, but a little bit reprogrammed, you can attack the services by un not authorized logic, just by using the logic in a different way. That is, if the protection of this application programming interface is only by logic and not by uh, additional um, uh, mechanisms like, for example, authentication service or so. That was the case. Uh, there was no authentication service. Just read them and there was only read access. Write access didn't happen in the old app, but it was not, it was not forbidden. It just didn't happen. So they reprogrammed it and made a write access and then they could change the timetables. This is just one example. Or another example, attacks, app, apps attack mobile data resources. Uh, this way, uh, apps uh, can be controlled by other services in a, in a bot's way, for example. Uh, and external attackers use an app, uh, an, an app in order to do something, for example, unauthorized distribution of pictures, of video records, of audio records. This is everyday life of misuse of apps. And um, more apps are bots controlled than, um, than we know of. Or apps are attacked by externals. External apps and service resources attack apps and the users. Uh, well, they are special in their mobile devices because why can they be attacked in a different way than, in a different way than, than other computers? For example, they have sensors and uh, they include of a lot of very personal information, much more than, than laptops or uh, desktop computers. And uh, through these sensors, um, is a very prominent um, way of attack into, into the apps. They are attractive because um, you can listen into the apps from outside and um, you can control them from outside and um, well then you carry your mobile with you with all the sensors and if it is controlled from outside you provide a lot more information than from your, from your laptop for example. Yeah, these are the sensors. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I got this picture from somewhere in the internet, and um, they have even forgotten some. So you see these sensors, but there's no micro. So there's also a micro. Also, the switches are sensors. So if you press switches, this is of course taking up information from outside. Keyboard, of course. Uh, or all the received data can also be misused in a way. And more output, there's a screen, there's a speaker, there's vibration. So there's a lot of um, communication of this device with the outside. Uh, and every single sensor is a very interesting point of attack. Yeah, we had that before. Traces which you, which you lay by mobility access to the internet, read, contact data, calendar, telephone says, ge geolocation data. This is something very special, geolocation data. A desktop, a desktop computer has no geolocation. There's one, one point in the world maybe, but this really goes with, with, with motion, with, with movement. So we always said people move through the world and data move through the world, but if you have a mobile, then people move together with their data and provide the data about the motion. So this is really accumulation of um, this type of, of information. So with the rights and permission model, the idea is some, there is so much information collected. And who is allowed to have access to this information? And how do you manage this, this, this permission? For example, in, in the first, as a first step, I would say I would allow nobody to have any access to any data, this is all my private data, nobody else should have information to this data. On the other hand, if I use, if I use an app which gives me train connection information, and I would like to have to the service to tell, please give me a train connection from, where, from the point where I am now, I don't know exactly where I am, where I am now to Munich, then of course I must allow this app to have access to the system geolocation data which are on the device. So 
I would accept to say, okay, for this kind of application, I would allow access to my geolocation data, but only for this purpose. So how is this organized with maps? There are global permissions which you give to an app before installation. That's the old Android model. And most uh, Android users here, I think most of you are 70%, according to the statistics, are uh, Android users. They, uh, they would follow the first model. There's a global permission. Before you install an app, you give permission to all the uh, details this app wants to have. You say yes, and if you have given the permission, then um, after uh, installing, the app would uh, be allowed to have all the permissions which have been uh, accepted in the beginning. Or with the, um, with the, with the Apple system, or with the Android 6, the Marshmallow system, this is a little bit um, uh, in a finer granulation. You give the permission not at installation time, but at usage time. So you start the app, the app starts running, and now it needs access to the geolocation data. You say, oh, wait, I need now geolocation data. Do you accept? Then I know what it's good for, and I can say yes. So this is, uh, this is the, 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 the other model. And there are protection mechanisms, especially now for, for Android, which help to have a finer granulation than with the global permission in Android 5. That is, the, you can really select different permissions and say, okay, this app should have permission to this and this and this information, but not to that and that information. Uh, and with the, with the iOS, you could always do that. And with the Marshmallow, you also have uh, the, 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 finer, the finer decision and this can be imitated by these helping ads protection mechanisms which you install uh, on your Android 5 system. Well, still, I think it is not easy to handle. And it's not easy to understand. Uh, and uh, both from the service point of view, but also from the um, uh, health point of view, for, for the good, healthy society, we need... Uh, we need um, another model which uh, is more realistic and, uh, and is, uh, can cannot be used as well for, for misuse as, um, as the, the, the existing models. So before we can do that, that that's why I say it's a research ch a challenge, um, what is fairness? Fairness means uh, a balance of interest of those who provide a service in, want to have access to data and the user who want to, be, uh, want to get the service on one hand but also want to be protected in his privacy. So we have to understand a good balance between risks and opportunities but nonetheless even here users are overloaded with, uh, with, with the work to decide and to understand what these permissions are about. Okay. Now, in order to understand how these apps work and how the permission model works, I would like to give you a very brief overview over the architecture, how these apps are built anyway. Um, I take Android as an example. Well, there are many others, but Android has a very dominant meaning. Um, I think I have a statistic here, even here. This is the youngest statistic from, from June, which says that Android in Germany, you can you can have the statistics for every country in the world, and it's pretty much the same in other countries as well, of three quarters, 75, more than 75% of mobile users are Android users. So it makes sense to understand how Android works. One of the advantages of uh, Android is the Android software development, which makes it much easier to write apps for Android than in the more closed environment uh, of Apple. So once you write, the, uh, you, you, you use the dev development kit, uh, not, not only it's a pretty easy application development through the, 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 the de development kit, but also all of a sudden you have a very seamless interaction with existing Google services um, like Gmail, the calendar, or contacts. So it makes it really easy and nice to, uh, to work with, uh, with, these, uh, with these Android uh, apps. And this is the, the, the basic architecture. Um, 
one, two, three, four, there are even five, uh, um, five areas which interact with one another. These are components, and the com components we're looking at are these apps, the applications. But they, of course, build upon other components, and, and the deep and the basic is uh, Unix, the Linux kernel, uh, with all the Linux elements which, which you have learned in, in your basic pro programming courses. Then there are some uh, libraries which help to use um, um, standard services like uh, databases, or here you have the, the SSL connection for encrypted communication, um, or you have uh, for, 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 for graphical usage. There are uh, libraries which you can use which are common to programmers even outside of the mobile area. So programmers who understand to uh, work with Unix or Linux, they are able to work with, uh, with the Android um, development kit as well. And then we have the applications. But it is not easy to use, if you program an application, to use the, uh, the libraries directly. So there is a middleware which helps you to have access to the standard service. For example, if you want to uh, program as an app that something which you want to express is visible on the screen of the mobile, you use the view system. There are standard um, uh, subroutines which you just call in your application program. And these subroutines make sure that the right basic kernel elements are called and, and used. So you need not do system programming. You just use the, the easy to use interfaces of the, of the middleware. So like viewing something or if you want to program something with a, with a telephone uh, or the location manager, Geo geolocation is one of the most interesting applications and it's very hard to do deep kernel programming with geolocations. But here you have a very simple interface uh, with some standard subroutines, uh, routines like give me the actual data uh, or do a first uh, estimation of how close it is to another place and so forth. So these, uh, these uh, th subroutines help to make the, to, to program the applications in an easier way. Yeah, a very important subroutine or component is the communication area. ICC is for um, inter, oh, inter component communication, so that's it. It's the communication between components. That is, how does one component, one app for example, communicate with another app? Uh, in the first place, within the mobile. But the interface is made like this, that the messages which are exchanged in order to communicate can also be across different mobiles, across the whole world. So it's the same program, it's just another address. If you ask, for example, an app which you write here, to have access to another app, for example, to the contacts app, of another mobile somewhere in the world. So this, this is organized by this inter-component communication module, which is, uh, which is protected also by Linux mechanisms. And um, it is through this component that the permission model is enforced. Permission means you are not allowed to communicate very openly to every other application. No, you must be able to allow other applications to communicate with you or to disallow. And this is enforced by the intercommunication component. So the permission model works with this intercomponent communication. Yeah. Keep it up. Intercomponent communication, which is protected by the basic operation system. I leave this away and come to the, yeah, there's a Linus kernel. I said that already, but I skip that now for, uh, um, because I think the basic understanding is already there. The same with the libraries. There are libraries like the web browser engine, like uh, for the programming in C, GNU C, or for database access, or for playing records, audio and video, or for graphics, uh, or the SSL library is very important because this helps to uh, encrypt um, communication. Okay, then we have the application framework, 
which is uh, the middleware, as I said before, higher level service application in the form of Java classes, and these can be directly used by the application programmers with no need to do deep system programming uh, with the Linux kernel. And applications are, yeah, what are applications? All the existing Android applications, which you know, like your, your contact, like your um, uh, planner, uh, uh, your, your, your date planner, uh, like your uh, email, like, um, like mess the telephone, of course, um, browser, games, and so forth, and every and every app which you write yourself. It's just the same level. There's no difference between a system app and an app which is written by yourself or which you download from somewhere. And an app is an app is an app. It is programmed and anything could be in there. So of course you need a permission model uh, to allow other apps to have access to some parts of your system. Well, what is an app? Applications are programmed um, pieces and there is a certain structure which makes it easier to organize these apps. And with Android, and it's not so much different with iOS as well, but especially with Android, there are certain component types. Every application consists of components out of four different types. And these components, they interact, communicate, through this uh, uh, intercomponents communication. And we will see that intercomponent inter communication is a message system. So a component, if, if it wants to read another component, it would send a message and, and tell in this message, please give me your data. And the response would be another message which tells, here are the data. And if I send a message, if one component sends a message to another component, then the permission model must be enforced. The permission model would make sure that only those data are exchanged which are allowed, which are allowed by the policy or by the, by the per, per, per specified uh, per, permission model. These messages in Android are called intents. So they, they would call it an, an, to send an intent. That means to send a message. I like this word because intent means there's an intention. The one who sends a message wants some, something from the other side, has an intention to influence, to do something. And this is really a, a, a good wording of what happens. Messages are always, in a way, dangerous. Yeah, and the ICC respects the permission model. And now I'll tell you the, how it looks like with the four components, there are four component types, namely so-called activities, so-called services, so-called broadcast receivers, and so-called content providers. These are the types of components that all apps consist of, and if you program an app, you will decide how do I organize my app with these component types. And in a way, it becomes clear what these com component types mean. The activity, first type, is, well, actually the top layer, the top level, is the presentation layer of an application. Per app, only one activity can be there. If one activity starts another activity, the first activity will die. Only one activity per screen. It defines an application programming interface for itself. Activities can start one another by passing values, or it is started by receiving values. The same, by the way, also with services, we'll see. And uh, one activity on the system has the keyboard and all the others have not. So um, there's a, a, a one activity always a, a, in, a, in the center. All the others would be suspended if one activity runs. Uh, and usually the entry point to the application, uh, to, to a service, is through an application like the main program. Um, and that would start user interfaces, that would start the other services, that would start the, the communication process and so forth. The next component type is a service, and a service can do all the same, like an activity, but service can run in the background. So that's what often happens, that an activity 
would start the service, the service would run in the background, and the activity could continue, could resume running. It's background processing, continue running after use inter interface, of, uh, if the interface uh, disappears again. Um, and, well, for example, download files, play music, send a mail. Know that if you use your, your email system and then you say send, then of course you still have your activity of the, the email system and the sending process is a service in the background. Then is the type of the content provider. Uh, the content provider is, the, um, uh, is, so to speak, a database, the, no the knowledge base. Provide relational database interface, store and share, share data. Um, there is access control. This is the most delicate component for, for data interchange because the content provider have all the information. Um, and there are other components which can perform uh, queries on the content provider like select, insert, delete, and so forth, so everything what you can do with databases as well. And then you have the communication process organized by the so-called broadcast receivers. Broadcast receiver. Broadcast is that what it means. Messages intents are sent out and only by permission models they are controlled where they really go and uh, a broadcast receiver of an app would be very careful to receive broadcasts from other, from other um, um, apps following the permission model. There are two ways to receive a message. One is the explicit uh, addressing through an URL. So if one app wants to access uh, a broadcast receiver, wants to communicate or exchange intense messages with another app, that means through the broadcast receiver, it could use an explicit address of these other broadcast receiver, which is a normal URL. This is, but not the, f the most frequent way of, of addressing. The most frequent way is the implicit addressing. That is, they give implicit addresses which tells the type of service um, which is of interest. Um, broadcast receiver sub would then uh, um, subscribe to such destinations. Um, one, one could be, for example, um, telephone, use the telephone. So you would write and uh, address the broadcast receiver of the telephone by sending out the implicit address, I want to have the telephone. And then the broadcast receivers of telephones would check if the coming in, incoming intent is allowed to get telephone information, yes or no. Every um, application describes its organization and its permissions by a special file. So every app has a so-called manifest XML file and this manifest XML file describes all components, main component, and describes all the permissions, as I will explain to you later, and would especially mark, and this is the main component with, with Th with which this application would start. So in order to understand what kind of permissions a model has, uh, 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 an application has, you just read the XML file, the manifest file. And the manifest file tells everything. That means if you want to specify for an app which other apps are allowed to exchange messages with this app, you put into the XML manifest file all the, all the permissions. And how this works, I explain to you now. Just for an example, yeah? Is there any chance that the manifest file gets hacked? Yes, of course. That's the, for the permission model, the most interesting part to hack. That's true. The XML, tile, XML file tells everything. So if, and this is also a way to improve your privacy in that you manipulate it in the way you want to have it, like but it can be also hacked in order to open it, and that's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, gone. Yeah, yeah, gone. Yeah, if it is hacked, the XML file is the master. Um, and uh, this may be also uh, an additional challenge to have uh, additional protection on the XML files or even to, to change the model altogether. The XML files are well specified, everybody knows them. So 
once you have access, it is easy, it is easy to, to, to change it. That's right. Excuse me, is that from Yeah? Even if you have the root access to the phone, yeah? you cannot get the external file. Why not? Because it's in the form of an integer. You have to do reverse engineering. No, no, no. The XML file. Ah, OK. That's right. Um, to, there are two different things. One is the programmed app, the, these components. They are programmed. And it's not easy to read them. You need the kind of reverse engineering in order to get the source. But the XML file which is always in parallel existing, is clear text. It's clear text XML. We, I'll give you examples. You will see how an XML file looks like. That's the meaning. You can change the, the XML file. Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah, you, you can change the XML file. The, yeah, well, the, the, now you're speaking about the, the internal protection system of the Linux system. They are protected in a way, but you can, you can, yes, it is a clear text file. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 You might, once the, uh, the app is running. Yes. You can read it. You can, you can read it. There's a system access to it. No, no. That's what we did with these with this protection mechanisms. With the protection mechanisms which we put on Android 5, we read into the XML files and change them at the specific points we need to. Yeah. Yeah. But not the XML file. Let's have a look on the files. Yeah. The first, which I already said, is the intercomponent interaction. Uh, by ICC mechanism is what, what we call the, the, the intents it are just uh, messages. And the messages contain of a destination address and then the payload data. And the payload data express the intent, what they want to do. So the Android methods accepts intents of this type. Start activity is, uh, is, um, is an intent. And what kind of int uh, activity could be here described here with the, with the address, or start a service with the address, send a broadcast with the intent of the broadcast, with the information which is brought to the other side, either by I want to read something, I want to write something, or here are the read data which you uh, requested, uh, or read data with the data to be, to, to be read, and others of this type. And the intent object defines the intent to perform an action on the destination component specified by the payload data. And uh, once we have this central mechanism for communication, we have also the uh, instrument with which we can enforce the permission model. The permission model uses the, the ICC in intent model. And how this works, I'll show you with the, with the, with the XML file uh, shortly. Yeah, I said already there's an explicit way of address, uh, addressing or the implicit way by a so-called action string, like, for example, contact. So if you send an, an, an uh, intent 
with the implicit address contact, then every broadcast receiver which has subscribed to this address would read this. And, and in the second step, then check if the permissions would allow to really exchange with this, uh, with this uh, intent. And if the permission is given, then the communication would resume. Yeah, I have here an example. Let's see if we, if we get, get through it so shortly. So this is uh, actually one, is actually two, two apps which work together as, uh, as a common service for the user. So actually it's one, one app starting, uh, uh, consisting of two parts. So the first app is this one, which is called Friend Tracker Application, and the other one is Friend Viewer Application. The idea of this is, learned this from, from Eng, on a very nice article which I recommend to you to read, the idea is following. The app tells you if real friends of you, personal physical friends, are in a physical environment of yours. You can specify within five kilometers or 10 kilometers or one kilometer. And if this happens, if one of your friends would become close here, for example, in Koblenz, and you don't know of it, but then your app would tell you, would pop up with a window and tell you, hey, your friend Max Meyer is, is there. So there's an opportunity to, to meet him physically. Um, well, this is very, very personal, isn't it? Um, and, and this is realized like this. There is an app which uh, uses an external web service. The external web service is outside of the apps. It's somewhere a service um, which, is com which uh, you get contact through, through normal web communication. And all those who have this app would agree that they send their location information to this external web service. So this external web service collects all the friends' information where they are and the apps are able to read from this external service and uh, decide this is close enough to my own position. So you see that there must be a program which is able to read to this external service and, always, uh, and also to write. That, well, the writing starts at the beginning, but before it reads there, of course, it must be started with the help of the location manager because the location data must be provided in order to give it to the web service. And if the external web service tell you, tells you a friend is close, it must be checked that this is really close to your, to your real position. So there is a um, communication between external web service and the, lo uh, the local location manager on the app, uh, on, the, on the mobile system. And this is, for example, organized by this friend tracker, which is a service. Service running on the mobile in the background. The activity here would just start this, and then the service is going to run. And all the information which is needed will be put into this database. And this will be exploited by another app on your mobile, which reads this information and um, organizes a map, puts the map on the viewer. This is all is a system component and makes it visible on your, on your mobile. And then you see your map. Here am I, and here's my friend. And this is organized through a lot of read, write, read, write. Of course, uh, services are started uh, and, and binding to, to system uh, components. Uh, through a, a hell lot of intents which are running on your mobile, within the mobile, and to the outside world. And um, I think it's pretty clear that this is very private, and you need a permission model in order to do what? For example, I and my friends, we have um, agreed upon one another, yes, we want to have this information, and you and your friends have done the same. We don't know of one another, but we use the same system. Now, it must be clear that if you get information of your friends, I do not get the same information. And you don't get the information of my friends. Unless we say, OK, now we are also friends. And then we would tell our system to accept also this intent exchange between the two of us. So that is a, an explicit giving permission. And as long as this permission is not there, the information will not be uh, g given to, to, to other um, broadcast receivers, which are technically the same system, but don't have the permission to, to, uh, to interact. Yeah, the presentation 
which I give to you here is only about this permission model. So if we talk about security or confidentiality or any other thing or denial of service or whatever you have and security problems is, is another topic. So all I tell you here is only about this kind of permission but the security problem of mobiles is much, much, much bigger. That's the reason why I give this as a information to you. So apps process resources, communicate resources with other apps, uh, even with part components of the other apps, and they all, among all in the world, worldwide, other domains, other devices, other domains, worldwide. And the question now is who is allowed to access my resources and how do I gain access to other resources? And the Android applications access model is the so-called uh, mandatory access control method. In general, there are two types of access control systems. One is the so-called discretionary access, the other one is the mandatory access. I don't want to go into detail here again. Just want to tell you that the Android system uses both models. Direct access control means I can pairwise decide with whom I want to exchange information. And mandatory access control means I can work with the help of labels. I thus just give a label and whoever uses this label will have the allowance to work with me. Um, the Mac model, which is the most powerful, and which is used by the Android system, um, is a label system, uh, and all components have labels, or and use labels, and the labels you have, and the labels you use of others, they must match. There's a matching rule. The matching rule tells these two labels fit, and therefore, permission is given. These two labels do not fit, and therefore there's no permission. So it's a, it's a label rule, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a label matching rule. And uh, I have here an, an example. If you have a component here, um, component one, component two, component three, um, and uh, the matching rule would be like this. You could specify that with mandatory access control. Read access is allowed only if reading component has no lower label numbers than the target component. And write access is allowed only if writing component has no higher label number than target component. Then you have here the label numbers, N3, N4, N1, N3, L1, L2. And just by the rule of number must be bigger or number must be smaller, the system can automatically derive if there is a read or write access. For example, here there is no read no right because you have one and two and one and three. And so one and two is on the other uh, one side. Two is bigger than one and two is smaller than three. So there can, can be no read or write access. While, for example, here you have a read access because three and four are both bigger than one and three. Bigger or equal. Three and four are both big, bigger than one and three. So there can be read access but no write because um, you can only write if the, if the numbers are bigger. So there's a write here and a read here, but not the other way around. So it's not necessary to, to understand this in detail. The point is that just by a matching rule, um, the, 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 the permission model is given. And if you would like to have a, a component which can be read by everybody, then you just make sure that your labels have very small numbers. And if you want to write to everybody, you make sure that you have very big numbers. That's it. And uh, with, the, with the Android system, it happens just the same. There are labels. Labels have some syntactic, um, uh, some syntactic rules. And there is a matching rule which compares the syntactics and de derives from the rule, OK, these uh, the, the syntactics fit to the rules, they are conformant to the rules, and therefore per permission is given. Mac labels are permissions. The labels from the mandatory access control are the permissions of the, of the Android system. Yeah, and there is a reference monitor which uh, is implemented on all Android systems, and this reference monitor just checks the rules. 
if rules are uh, followed, then there's a, there's a permission given. If the rules are not followed, the permission is not given. So this is within the system, and uh, users need not uh, care about the, the reference monitor. This is done automatically. They only have to care about the labels themselves. Okay, the example is... No. No. No, no. Password is, is, um, password is really individual. If you know the password, then you, can, then you have access. If you don't know, you, you have no access. Let us look at the example and then uh, follow the question. I give you the example how the labels look like, and then the decision is pretty clear. I have two apps. One app is called Whoop, and the other one is called Blah. And Whoop wishes to have access on activity Blah, especially on a com uh, uh, the, the activity is a component within Blah, and the activity is called Blah1. Whoop wishes at some point of its programming running, at some point, to start the program code of Blah1. So you have two applications, whoop and blah, and whoop is programmed in a way that it wants to start blah. Is it allowed or not? That looks like this, and blah's manifest file, that's blah wants to be protected. Blah wants not to be called by everybody. So in blah's manifest file, they would create a permission, give it a certain name, and say whoever wants to start me must have this permission. So blah creates a permission, and then the component, it would specify exactly, blah specified a permission, gives it the name blub, that other apps must have if they want to access blah. And in whoop, who wants to start blah, must have this permission. So, in short, blah says, if you want to start me, you must have blub. And whoop wants to start blah, says, I have blub because I want to start blah. Here you are. Here you have an, an app which is called pack and does not have the permission blub. It has only the permission p1. It has only p1 and not blub. And therefore, pack is not allowed to start blah. Blah is on the right hand side, always the same. And blah says, I, I create the permission blub. And in order to start the activity blah, the permission blub is required. So when now PAX wants to start blah, then the reference monitor, and that was your question, would check, does this P1 fit to blub? Would say, no, this is P1, this is blub, this doesn't fit. It will not be started. While if another app, namely the add whoop, which does have the permission blub, then the reference monitor would check, okay, you have blub, you require blub, it fits, you may read. That's it. That's sort of like a password. Somehow. But it's public. The, uh, it's public. Yeah. It's not hidden. Okay. Everybody knows who wants to start blah must have the permission blub. So now comes the point. It's public. You want to start blah, and you know from system description that you require the permission blub. Therefore, in your program, you would write this manifest file and say, I have blub. And at installation time, now comes Google Store, says, hey, he wants to have blub. Do you allow that? And now you, as a user, are asked. You would say, oh, he wants to have blub. No. So it wouldn't be installed. If you say yes, then it would be installed, blub is there, and can start. <laughs> Everybody says yes, that's the, that's the dangerous point of it. Yeah. Now, that's, it's really not a password. It is really made public. Uh, the, the, the permission of the calendar is well known. The permission of the calendar is calendar. If you write an app and you want to read the calendar of your friend or of your enemy or of anybody in the world, you write in your app calendar. Then the other person would download your app and would immediately be informed, hey, he wants to read your calendar, because that's written here. I want to have calendar. And you would say, no, not of this app. Kill it, and then it wouldn't be installed. And it said, yes, 
then it would be installed and calendar is here, calendar is here, it can read. That's, that's how it works. And this is the XML manifest file, which is, uh, which is uh, a, a clear text and you, 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 you specify it in a way and you, you change it in a way and that's what the system also does in, in, in Marshmallow and iOS is, is by the way uh, the same. If you say, okay, now I want to change the permission model, uh, no calendar anymore, then you can switch off, you can switch off here the, the, the special permission. Normally there's not, not one permission, there are 20, 30 permissions and you can delete them. Yeah, that's all what I said and I can, yeah. Once app whoop is installed on a device with this permission blob, it will be allowed to start component blah. At installation time, before installation of whoop, and this is true for Android 5. Ach, jetzt ist ja auch alle. Yeah, Android 5. At installation time. The, 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 the app is downloaded at installation time. You must give all the permissions. And um, with, with Marshmallow or with iOS, it is a little bit better. Permission at execution time, not at installation time. You install it, that's fine. And then when you start it, the app whoop is installed on the device with this permission, then the permission is not yet active. It is there, but it's not yet active. When the client starts whoop, at, any, at, at the very point where whoop calls the component blah one, under it checks if use permission and require permissions match. So if blub is, if he is P1 and he has blub, then the system would, uh, would stop at once. But if he is blub and there is blub, it would not activate the communication. But then would first ask if they do not match, it's, it's not executed, if they match, the client now is asked, do you want, do you allow access? And then the user can say yes, and then it's executed, or you say no, and it would not be executed. Yeah, and that's the, the new ads of Marshmallow. With Marshmallow, it's, Marshmallow is as nice as Apple is, so please buy <laughs> Android in future. No continuous access by apps under Android Marshmallow. You can decide yourself when and on what apps on your device have access. Moreover, you can deactivate permissions at any time. Yeah, and all the, the Apple users, yes, we had that before. Okay. Now there are different uh, ways how the different types of applications um, can be protected. Uh, this goes pretty much in detail and I just want to give you the surface of it. For example, services are protected just like activities. Um, it's also through these attributes and w once the attribute is there, the attributes or the, 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 the permissions a match then there's read access, there's write access, there's execute access, there's any kind of access. Um, but with the content providers, um, you can really make a difference between read access and write access. This is done by program code. So if you write a content provider, then you can put into the code, oh, I'm sorry, that's also on the XML file. It's in the, in the component of the, the content provider. Um, you would have different permissions. You can make a difference between read permission and write permission. You cannot do that with activity. With activity is just one type of, of permission. But with content provider, it's the database. Somebody might be allowed to write into the database, but not read. Others may be allowed to read from the database, but not write. And uh, broadcast receivers also can be, broadcast receivers are the community, communication components. They can be protected on both sides, on the sending side, on the receiving side. That means for receiving, very important, I want to protect my app against getting wrong requests or data which I'm not interested in or which I regard as dangerous. And then you would say no read. And you can make a difference between read, send broadcast, register receiver, you cannot receive to, uh, I'm not ready to receive data from you or sending I uh, would not allow you to send anything. So sending and, re uh, and receiving can also be, um, can be treated in a different way by, uh, by broadcast receivers. So broadcast receivers 
and content providers have a difference between read and write access. Yeah, I think it is pretty clear that unprotected broadcast intends endanger privacy. We have the example of the friend tracker. Um, if uh, your broadcast receiver is not protected um, against uh, read access and write access or make a difference, then you get information of friends who are not your friends or you provide information to friends who are not your friends. Yeah, um, that's interesting for, for, for programmers. You declare components as public or private. Once you declare them as public, then there's no, uh, no uh, permission control anymore. Everybody can read or write on them. And if you declare them as private, then the, the matching model um, is being enforced. Typical system app permissions, well, access network state, internet, access to internet, write external storage, write settings, use camera, vibrate, and so forth, all these things which are often asked. And these are all publicly known permissions. So if you write a program, an app, and want to have uh, access to, to the camera, then you use this permission. Or you require this permission, you ask for this permission. Yeah, there are normals, there are dangerous, there are signature systems, and uh, the, the public thinks the normal is permission is granted to any app asking for it. Dangerous users to confirm permission at installation time, and there are even more protected apps, system uh, protected permission is granted only to apps signed by the same developer key. Um, so there's even a, a, a higher level of protection uh, which uh, uses signatures. Okay, finally, um, the permission groups. The reason is there are so many different permissions and uh, the, uh, there is an understanding that users will never be able to make a clear difference between all these applications, all these, all these different types of, of permissions. So the idea of Android was to uh, collect them in groups. Only a handful of groups and people might understand groups and that's easier. So they will not ask you for permission for any, every detailed uh, permission, but only for permission groups. On the other hand, groups are big. So if you allow for a specific permission within the group, all the others within the group are also allowed. So this is um, advantage and disadvantage of permission groups. Before you download an app on Google Play, you may need to give the app permission to access specific spe capabilities or inf information on your device, known as permission group. This should help the users to have a better understanding. So users confirm permission groups. Once accepted, there is no confirmation for update, all or nothing within this group. So that's also a little bit dangerous. Uh, this is, of course, criticized a lot. I give you here examples for articles where this, 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 is, uh, this is criticized. And I can just give you ideas of what type of groups we have. For example, the group in-app purchases. So this uh, refers to all permissions which allow the app to do purchase, which means using the internet, browsing, using the payment system, and so forth. So you can associate everything which goes with, with purchase. With purchase, does it include telephone? Yes, no, so this is not very clear. So better to read exactly in uh, the details of such a group in order to understand what kind of permissions are included. Device and app history, read sensitive log data, retrieve system eternal state, read your web bookmarks and history, retrieve running apps, Retrieve running apps. It says so it's on device and app history. Retrieve running apps. So if you allow to say, yes, device and app history, that's okay. But it also means that all the running apps will also be known to the one who has access to this group. Or cellular data, data settings it goes with, with uh, geolocation. All identity things. Find accounts on the device. Read your own contact card modify your own contact card, add or remove accounts. That's a lot. So I was asked, this app uh, wants to have access on your identity. So yes, of course, it must have this access. 
because um, you must know my identity. But I didn't know that it means add or remove my accounts. OK, and so forth. Contacts. Can use your device contacts. Read and modify. Calendar. Can use your device calendar information. Read calendar, add or modify. Oh, this can be a very nice app. So for example, if you share calendars, I want to write a date on your calendar. You know that. You say, OK, that's what this app is good for. I allow. But sometimes you don't want others to write in your calendar. If you give calendar, then that's gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very, very nice uh, app. We use that as well. Um, but sometimes maybe I would like to give somebody just read access. You, you should be able to read, read my calendar. But please don't write it to my calendar. You cannot make a difference here. Calendar is calendar, everything. Yeah. It's too coarse. Or location, even the same, yeah, location is clear. But here with SMS, for example. Read to re receive SMS, yeah, that's OK. Receive text message, yes. Read text message, well. Edit, no. Send, no. <laughs> I don't give you, allow you to send my access, uh, and so forth, yeah. So th that's the, the main message. There are a lot of, with the phone, much, many, many more permissions are given than you might think of if you just read the title of the group. Camera, microphone, Wi-Fi. Bluetooth connection information, wearable sensors, device ID, call information, and the best is other. <laughs> other is good. Read your social stream, write to your social stream, access subscribe feeds. Well, all others. <laughs> yeah, or use it. <laughs> use it and so on. Okay. This is a citation of an interesting article of Nani who describes the problem with very clear examples. And you can look into that if you go through, through the information which is left to you for, for further study. A few minutes. Users view self-data protection for apps. Not much to say. Check permissions requests carefully. OK, yes. I do it very carefully. Today, maybe, but tomorrow I have other things to do with this. Yes, 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 yes. Um, refrain from data hungry apps. Indeed, there are sometimes you have uh, alternatives. Uh, not always, but for, for example, with the, with the, uh, with the train uh, connection app, you have no, no, no alternative. You have only the one, and you can only hope that uh, Deutsche, Deutsche Bahn system. Um, has a data minimization principle. They swear they have. We trust them. Yeah, no, no, no. That, yes, that, that, was, that, that was a problem some years ago, and they have, of course, reprogrammed it. Yeah, but, yeah, Mo yeah. The, 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 the access to the data, is, is some kind of access, like read access, to read access is not dangerous, and they, they make it public. So you use the app, and, and uh, they use the, the train, uh, the official train app, you get it. You use another app, you get it. The point is that they want to protect it against write access. And the write access was not protected um, by authentication methods, um, it was just protected by logic. That is, if you knew the right subroutine name, then you could just write into it. And um, they have changed that. You can write to it if you know the right name and if you are authenticated. That was not the case before. So it was only by knowing the right, knowledge, uh, the, the, the right logic. Yeah, but sometimes you have, uh, you have the, for, for example, there's a privacy-friendly scanner, QR scanner, which has been programmed uh, here by, by a research group in Darmstadt. Um, you can read all the source code uh, and, um, and see that they really do, that this app, and they, they publish the XML file, 
so you can you can directly check what this uh, what, what what this app does. But again, of course, this is a user overload. Who is able to read the source code of other apps in order to check if they are privacy friendly? Check permissions at every update version. Consider the use of protection apps or a, a model like like Mar Marshmallow Six. Technical support of self data protection. There are protection apps. They make a lot of load and work for you, but if you are interested in them, there's there's a lot of a lot of help out there. Um, change source code of data hungry apps. That's uh, da da data hungry apps. This is um, this is um, um, a work only for for professionals. It's nothing for for everyday user. And even though it is dangerous because changing permissions means you must exactly know which permissions are needed in order to perform the service. And if you kick out those permissions which are needed for the service, then you kill the service. So this is, this is uh, really dangerous. On the other side, it's also a legal problem. To change source code is also a problem of, of uh, copyright. You are not always allowed to change copyright protected uh, source code. With open source license, then it's okay. Changing the operating system uh, in order to, to uh, manipulate um, the, the permissions um, is a difficult question. It, first of all, it could have unwanted side effects. Of course, Google extension functions warns against these dangerous apps. Uh, Android is open source, so there's no license problem, but you have the other problems of that. You must really know exactly what you're doing. So, apps interact across domains, across, devi across devices, and worldwide. You should be aware of that. Your devices, your apps are connected, not only in this room, <laughs> but really worldwide. And there is a very nice security model, access control model, um, which uh, uses this um, <coughs> mandatory reference monitor. It works nicely, technically but it is not easy to understand. Um, there is a separation of the app code from the XML file, which makes the, um, the management of the permission easier, but of course uh, it's also uh, a subject to, to, um, to manipulation. Well, the Android uh, mandatory access control works by matching permission rule, as I explained, and is enforced by the mandatory access control mechanism of the intercomponent communication uh, and is also supported by a secure Linux kernel. User handling, well, permission groups are two cores, according to my uh, feeling. Um, user unfriendly permission model is the confirmation model, which is so complicated that most users always say yes, and it's not really a control. Um, and the support uh, of, um, of the uh, uh, Privacy-friendly management, it's available but not easy to use. So maybe Android Marshmallow or the iOS permission models are better. Um, anyway, they are accepted out there, but also they are not perfect. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> are there any more questions beyond what we have al already discussed here? I'm still here. We have also an exercise group at 3 o'clock, so we can resume discussion then. Yeah, as I said, I, as, uh, the main difference is that the iOS has the, has the permission at, uh, at, execu at, at execution time, not at installation time which is in a way better. But Marshmallow 6, well, it, is, it was so successful that Marshmallow has copied uh, this idea. Basically, it is the same model. Now, in detail, there are many differences. It's harder to, to, to program. The shop is, is more closed, but the, the, the permission model in, in, in its basics is, is the same, yeah. Yeah? Is that so? Okay. 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 
Okay, I, take it simple. Not really. <laughs> In a way, yes, it is safer, but it has much to do with the closed shop. It is much more closed. And that's a matter, of course, that in open systems, when the programming interfaces are all open and everybody can provide apps and there are different uh, stores where you can download your things which are not uh, controlled the same way, is a more dangerous world. It's a richer world, but more dangerous. Uh, from the technical point of view, I think it's not really a difference. Oh, sehr gut. Das kann man immer brauchen. Dankeschön.